Welcome to day two of our business journey this week. This is Business Morning on Channels Television. I'm in John Mekwa. Well, let's dive right into it, starting with what's going on in the global oil space. Brent oil prices were a little changed, reversing earlier gains of a dollar as investors weighted supply concerns, highlighted by potential production cuts in Norway and worries about possible global recession curtailing fuel demand. Brent's good features for September settlement edged up 0.2% to $113.73 a barrel, while U.S. West Texas Intermediate Crude climbed $1.95 to $110.95 a barrel, and that's from Friday's close. There was no settlement for WTI yesterday because of the Independence Day in the United States. While there are demand concerns, given the gloomy and macro outlook, the market is still expected to be tight for the remainder of the year. Another driving factor is that Norwegian offshore workers began a strike that will reduce oil and gas outputs. Back here in Nigeria, the federal government has developed and issued an insurance guideline to drive the retention of oil sector financial spending and help reverse capital flight. This is one of the outcomes of the Nigeria Oil and Gas Conference with the theme Threatening Nigeria Content Implementation with Seven Ministerial Regulations. When you look at the vision of NCDMB, is to act as a catalyst yeah, for the development of the sector and its linkage industry. Because when you look at the oil and gas side, there are so many links associated with it, be it logistics, be it legal, be it insurance, uh, be it uh, banking. There are all those linkages to the oil and gas business. So that's what we are trying to drive in order to achieve it. Because we've said it, uh, prior to the enactment of the Act, local content in the industry was less than 5%. But within a space of 12 years, we've moved it to 42%. That is a huge achievement. And our desire and hope is to get it to 70% by the year 2027. And that is our 10-year strategic roadmap. The 10-year strategic roadmap is very focused, very targeted on short, medium, and long-term activities that we must execute in order to get that 70%. Uh, we just don't make that pronouncement of 70%. What it's backed up with is what we've been implementing, and one of it is also in the insurance sector. The legal sector is also there. We're looking at it. We're working with NBA to say, how do we domicile all our legal agreements in country? I've challenged the uh, president of uh, NBA to please come out with the figures associated with those legal agreements that we enter so that we know what we are chasing. While well, still staying in the oil and gas uh, industry, output from 10 members of OPEC in June fell by 100,000 barrels a day to 28.52 million barrels per day off their pledged increase of 275,000 barrels per day. Meanwhile, the chief executive officer of the Nigerian Upstream Petroleum Regulatory Commission, Mr. Benga Kumalafe, has said that Nigeria lost a billion dollars in revenue in the first quarter of this year to crude oil theft. Imagine what the amounts would do to Nigeria's reserve, which has been dwindling for some time now. Well, we have the director of the Institute for Oil, Gas, Energy, Environment, and Sustainable Development at the Afe Babalala University, Professor Damilola Olawi, SAN, joining us to share his thoughts on this. Good morning, Prof. Thank you so much for joining us. Good morning, and it's my pleasure to be with you. Good to have you. So, 10 OPEC members are not able to meet up with their quota, so Nigeria is not alone uh, in this. Should we then be concerned? Is our own case different? Well, we should generally be concerned because um, the implication is that we are failing to benefit from the current high oil price environment. Um, and as you mentioned, the, the country needs... Uh, money. We need money for infrastructure. We need money uh, to address some of the uh, challenges uh, facing different sectors of the economy. So if the whole world is benefiting from the high oil price environment and we are not benefiting, then we should generally be worried. So if we're losing a billion dollars in a quarter, 
<laughs> I don't know what we're going to do by the second quarter. And yes, we do have increased subsidy because, of course, globally, uh, the fluctuation in the oil prices is, is upwards, even though it comes down, it's above $100. You know, can we actually continue to live like this? Is there nothing drastic that Nigeria can do? to deal with this issue, especially the issue of oil theft and vandalism? Yes, it's a very good question. You know, that is the big reason why we are not benefiting uh, from the oil price environment, like I mentioned, because it, uh, attempts to ramp up production often end up in the wrong hands. So you have um, people vandalizing um, pipelines, you have um, some sophisticated entities uh, involved in crude oil theft, and the end result is that even when we try to ramp up production, it just uh, it does not show in our figures because it's been taken illicitly by uh, by uh, like I said a web of of um, anti uh, uh, anti development agents like I would call them. So I think we need to sit back and have a national dialogue on how to increase our security environment around the the, the oil producing areas. Some have suggested in the past the, the, the importance of having surveillance agreements with local communities, uh, because they are the ones there, they are the ones on the ground, they are the ones that know where this theft is happening, they are the ones that know what could be done. So in the past, and you've seen that uh, work very well in some countries, whereby they are able to enter into a, you know, a tripartite arrangement between the government, the security agencies, and the local communities to ensure that there is 24-hour surveillance around uh, oil and gas infrastructure in order to prevent uh, illicit uh, activities that are that are ongoing. Without addressing some of these challenges, we will continue to see that dip, which will continue to affect us given the, the significant amount of money we need uh, for, for, for development activities. Apart from the security challenges, you know, which, which uh, we've mentioned all theft, we've mentioned pipeline vandalization, uh, which of course often result in supply disruptions as well. We also have operational challenges that need to be carefully looked at. You know, um, due to some of these problems we've mentioned, we've seen uh, a, a rapid increase in divestment from our oil and gas industry because a lot of stakeholders are worried that even when they produce, the, the, you know, it doesn't go to where it should go to. So, uh, All right, Prof, just, just before you get to that divestment uh, of assets, uh, that's, well, we're going to talk about that. But, you know, something you said actually uh, supports what a lot of people have been saying when you said that sophisticated entities are involved in this issue of oil theft. Because somebody has noted that oil theft is not the same thing as stealing tomatoes. So it's not something Thing you just speak up. It has to be someone who has the technical skills, who is an insider or has an insider. Does this suggest that perhaps there is the issue of lack of political will to deal with this problem? Because I mean, they are not ghosts and obviously they are not laymen. These are skilled individuals that are involved in this oil theft. Exactly so, exactly so. And there, is, there are a lot of accountability questions that one may ask. Uh, if you have security agencies that are responsible for surveillance in that area, and uh, for some reason, um, their uh, officers are unable to you know, prevent this problem, then one may ask questions related to, are we, putting, are we posting the right people there? Are we uh, providing them the equipment that they need to do their job? Are they trained? Are they uh, capable? Because the truth is that, like you mentioned, you're not you're not talking of stealing uh, uh, yeah, you know uh, something uh, that is easily that could easily be stolen they are talking of uh, a, you know a, a national infrastructure which is guarded by security agents and then at the same time these activities go on so like i said a lot of accountability questions can be asked and so we need to ask are we are we providing our our security agents with the right tools are we giving them the right training do they have the motivation to do what they are asked to do? And if the answer is no, then, then significant changes should occur to ensure that we prevent what I describe as a monumental disgrace for a country of Nigeria's stature. What would you say should be that significant uh, change? Well, I, I will be in favor of more training, really. More training, uh, to, uh, for, for our, more training for our security agents. Number two, um, providing them the right equipment. And number three, uh, ensuring that uh, our security agents themselves, 
they have what I call in-house review of what they are doing on the ground. Some of the reports that we get on the ground show that there could be issues of collusion as well. Collusion between, uh, you know, the, the, the local communities and even some security agents, as we've been told. So I think these are issues that require accountability review to ensure that, because you can't keep doing uh, the, the same thing and you expect different results. If, if we've been having the same problems and nothing is changing, then I think a significant accountability review and overall is long overdue. All right, and then you start talking about divestment of assets. We've seen some uh, corporates, you know, oil companies uh, leaving the country, selling off their assets. And uh, how, what do we attribute this to? Is it unfriendly environment, uh, operating environment, or is there something else? Mm. Yeah, um, yes. Um, uh, can you still hear me, though? Yes, I can hear you. Very well, very well. You know, it's common uh, uh, business terminology that investments will go to where the investment climate is correct, where the investment climate is the most favorable. That is where investment we go to. So in a situation whereby you're having a challenging you know, investment environment, you're having issues relating to security, issues relating to supply disruptions, like we've mentioned, then to norm normally weaken the confidence of investors. And that's what we've been seeing, a situation whereby some of our longstanding players in the industry are beginning to question the, the, you know, the, 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 the sense in their continued engagement. And that's why we've been seeing divestments. But apart from those operational challenges, we also have general issues relating to accessing finance as well. Um, there, there's been issues relating to financing. Um, of course, you've seen how the, the foreign exchange has been, uh, um, you know, yo-yoing for a while, you know. So in that kind of environment, then you, you see um, operators finding it increasingly difficult to access finance and technologies, raw materials as well. Another key issue that is, that is you know, leading to significant divestment is the issue of energy transition. Um, even when uh, uh, banks and other commercial entities want to finance oil and gas investment, they, they wonder whether it will, you know, it will be sustainable in the long run because the world is paying significant attention to this issue of reducing, uh, you know, production, energy transition in order to address, um, you know, uh, climate change and other uh, environmental problems that the world is combating. So when you have those question marks, then you see that investors are very slow in making, uh, making decisions. But in all of this, there is a need for us to then ask ourselves, are we getting, are we, are we putting our um, uh, oil and gas industry, are we restructuring it to cope with the current uh, 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 prevailing investment environment? Because if we are not restructuring, if we're not ensuring we take the necessary legal and policy uh, uh, changes that are necessary, then you'll find out that, um, you know, um, there, there is a risk of irrelevance in which investment will continue to go to countries where some of these questions have been sufficiently answered. Yeah, I guess that's where the PIA comes in. But just before we get to the PIA, I hope we'll, be, we'll have enough time for that. The, the, the summit, the oil and gas summit uh, in Abuja, is looking at increasing local content. So at least if the international companies are leaving, then at least we should have more local players. How uh, productive has that effort been? Well, we, we've had some good news in the last few weeks in which, you, you know, some marginal uh, uh, field licenses were issued to uh, over 100 uh, indigenous companies. So that shows you that at least uh, the local content um, effort has been yielding good results. Uh, we, we now have more indigenous companies with the, with the tools, with the training to at least compete in, in, in the oil and gas sector so that that is some good news but that needs to be increased you know yeah the, the target that has been set is 70 percent local content we're not there yet and we're not close to it yet so we need to continue to ensure that we enhance domestic and local capacity uh because if like you mentioned if iocs are living um then it wouldn't be too much of a panic if we have so you know sufficient capacity at home to uh you know to fill the the, the, the slot or the gap left you know left behind by them so i think um we need to focus more on local content we need to focus more on on not just local content on paper but ensuring that um those that are in the industry are able to access finance are able to access um training are able to access 
support that they need to compete favorably. Uh, when we do that, we will be strengthening our domestic capacity that we'll be able to sustain our industry, irrespective of what the international players are doing. Yeah, but I mean, there's nothing to say that the local players will be covered or protected against the same plight which the international players. The issue of oil thefts and vandalism, there's, there's nothing. If, if nothing new is done, they can't be protected against such, such vices. You're very correct. And, and that, that is the big worry. Um, and that, that is the, you know, the, the oil and gas industry uh, now, and some, some, some of us, are, you know, will, will look at the domestic players and say, wow, they, they are very, very, you know, they are, they are taking a significant risk. But we know that in business as well, the higher the risk, the higher the reward. So, um, so if they, of course, the, the investment environment is currently risky due to the oil theft and other issues. But uh, if they are able to reorganize, and I have been working with some of them, just ensuring that they are able to, uh, uh, you know, uh, manage those risks. Some of those risks are, we've talked about operational risk, uh, you know, even, even uh, security risk, pricing risk as well, and transition risk. These are all risks, and the higher the risk, the higher the reward, if you manage the risk very well through significant risk management approaches at the company level, ensuring that uh, your, your, for example, when you're on the field, how do you ensure that your, your activities are, you know, protected, you know, from, from security risks? For, for example, maybe entering into, uh, you know, security arrangements at that level to ensure that at least your own staff on the ground are covered. So these are, there are a wide range of tools that are available to our domestic players. They know the terrain better, which is a, an advantage for them. They know the terrain. They've been in the terrain longer than any IOC will, you know, can, uh, can understand the local terrain. You know? so, so I think uh, they, they can tap from this uh, you know, local knowledge or, or local intelligence and ensure that they can at least effectively manage some of this wide range of, of risk that we're talking about. Yeah, we do hope that they can actually use that uh, local intelligence, as you mentioned there. And then you also talked about the issue of legal, you know, the legal framework, legal protection. And I guess that's why we fought so hard to have the PIA. Uh, I mean, I'm careful to say, has the implementation of the PIA been uh, delayed? Because uh, in some parts we see it working, but in the areas of uh, subsidy and some other areas, we don't, we don't see implementation. I mean, you are in there, Prof. Please tell us what's going on with the PIA. Well, the, the Petroleum Industry Act is a very, very uh, significant development for, for us in the industry. And, you know, we all celebrated it because it brings new um, insights into ensuring uh, maximization of our resources to, to the, for the development of our people. So it's a positive development. Uh, an effort are ongoing. You can see that the midstream agency has been set up. You can see that the upstream agency, you know, uh, they, they've been set up. Uh, but I, what I think, though, is that the implementation could be faster and could be stronger. I think um, a lot, I mean, this is, this is a law that we've been waiting for, for, for an upward of 20 years. So everyone is naturally anxious to see a rapid implementation and to see the results. So I think that is where we need to, we need to increase our efforts because you know, the, the, the pace at which we're implementing the act is still slow. The act talks about you know, in a number of changes that should occur. Some of them have not occurred yet. Um, so th that is why there are question marks. But there's no doubt about the fact that the PIA is going to bring um, organization more than we've seen in the past in the industry. We've, we've always complained for years about issues of, you know, uh, you know, uh, excessive uh, regulation, different uh, regulators, different, uh, you know, not knowing who is responsible for this and that. The PIA has addressed all of that. We now have two solid agencies that are responsible for a lot of things. We, you know, the, the PIA has also introduced significant uh, fiscal uh, incentives for local uh, communities. But then why is the implementation not progressing as fast as we want? That is the question we are asking and that is the push that we are going to continue to make. Yeah, Prof, I will, we'll look up to you and people like you to continue with that push since you're closer to the, the stakeholders, the controllers of affairs in the oil and gas industry. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Dami Lola Olawi, SAN, Director of uh, OGES Institute at Afeba Balala University. Thank you so much for your time and uh, do enjoy the rest of your day.
Thank you very much. We'll take a break now. After the break, well, we'll continue with our commodities market segment, and the conversation is not very far away from the one we just had. Oil and gas tops the conversation among other commodities. Do join us again. This is Business Morning on Channel Television. Okay, welcome back. You're still watching Business Morning on Channels Television. Well, last week, the Chief Executive Office of the Nigerian National Petroleum Company, the NNPC, Ms. Amelie Chiari, disclosed that Nigeria made a billion dollars from gas sale to Portugal this year alone and anticipates more hard currency at the completion of the Trans-Sahara gas pipeline stretching from Nigeria across Niger to Algeria and anchoring in Spain. Well, to help us understand uh, the logistics and expectation from this, we have Longida Four, an analyst with Financial Derivatives Company. He joins me here in the studio. Hi, Longi. Good morning. Good morning. Glad to be here. Good to have you, Longi. Uh, a lot of Nigerians, well, happy to hear that Nigeria made a billion dollars from gas. But, I, I, I mean, the last we heard of this was the gas... The pipeline was in construction and we needed investment. And then the EU came to Nigeria to try, you know, to have talks. And then there's the promise from Europe, you know, to invest more in it. So we didn't know that uh, we had started uh, already shipping to Portugal. Shipping to Portugal. Yeah, it is very welcome news. And especially it comes at a time when uh, we are experiencing issues in regards to oil exports and oil production. So it is very welcome news, to say the least. And uh, of course, yeah, Nigeria has... Uh, been shipping gas to EU, EU, other EU countries apart from uh, Portugal as well. Uh, and this is due to, rather, this has been through ships and not just with the pipeline. No, of course, when the pipeline is completed, we can expect more gas shipments to go on and continue. Yeah. You have NNLG. Yes. Uh, but they are producing to take care of lo uh, local or domestic uh, demand. I, this, I, I remember the federal government gave that order uh, for, I think that was last year? Yes. And they are still producing for domestic uh, consumption. But it's not enough, obviously. I think I, I bought gas last week. Yeah. I bought it for 10,000 naira. Yeah, no, oh. <laughs> it's, it's, it's not enough yet. But yeah, with the news of Portugal, Melikiari, the... Uh, NNPC chief executive has also said that the NNPC is putting more infrastructure and development in place to try to boost domest both domestic supply and, of course, international supply on the international markets. So we, c we should expect to see some reasonable um, value in regards to this in the near term. Yeah, definitely. Well, I mean, uh, some people would expect that the domestic demand should be taken care of first, first yeah. you know, before we start shipping out there. Yeah, definitely. That is what you would traditionally expect. But then we should keep in mind uh, what's happening globally and internationally. Like you said, uh, I believe five ambassadors from the EU visited in April to try and uh, support, uh, try and build up support and express EU interest in Nigerian uh, gas. And we are seeing the fruits of this uh, interest now. Like you've said, we've seen uh, gas imports to Portugal increase. Nigeria has a very large amount of uh, gas, re proven sure, gas reserves. Yeah. Uh, I think we have the largest trillion. in Africa. Exactly. So uh, the fact that we are now seeing these large gas reserves that have previously been underutilized now beginning to see uh, more, bring more value to the country is very welcome news. And of course, that should also trickle down to the domestic markets eventually. Mm, eventually. But, you know, a billion dollars coming into the account of the NNPC, where is it? <laughs> <laughs> I know you're not yeah. in NNPC. <laughs> I know uh, you're not in NNPC, but, you know, I mean, subsidy uh, uh, budget has gone up to 4 trillion naira yeah. and still climbing. Queues are back there. I mean, I bought, I bought fuel, petrol yesterday and I didn't buy it at the official rate. Yeah. So if you see a filling station selling, at least between yesterday and today, they're not selling at official Sorry, rates. You're more than likely getting it for about 180. Exactly. About, yeah. And they are saying, the operators are saying landing costs and all of that have increased. Yes. I mean, we we, we're here, we read global oil prices surging every day. So we do not expect it to be the same. Yes. So obviously subsidy goes up. So um, what's going on? So uh, in regards to subsidies, subsidies are, to put it in the simplest terms, they are sort of a double-edged sword. So on one hand, you have the fact that they are helping to reduce uh, inflationary pressure, which we know Nigeria is currently feeling the brunt of right now. But then on the negative side, they are diverting a lot of... Uh, 
finances that could have been used for more reasonable infrastructure and development related projects. Which so, will also still yeah. trickle into the, trickle economy. Into the economy. It will reduce yeah. operational costs for manufacturing and the real sector and eventually to reduce uh, some of those inflationary pressure that we're talking yeah. about. It is also affecting supply. So because the Nigerian uh, oil market is highly regulated, uh, we are seeing foreign optics, foreign suppliers from uh, the Middle East and India, rather than diverting gas supplies to Africa like they usually should, they are now diverting them to more uh, unregulated markets where they can get higher prices for these uh, oil commodities. So that is sort of causing a supply issue uh, in Africa right now in regards to energy and oil prices. Do you happen to know the level of agreement or arrangement with Europe? You know, the mm -hmm. EU and Europe, they, they, they've promised to, uh, you know, invest more in infrastructure, especially the pipeline and yes. all of that. Because we know that the pipeline projects have been on for years. It yeah, didn't, they it didn't just on, start. They have been on for years. You know, yeah. do you happen to know maybe some of those details? So, not the uh, exact terms of the agreements haven't been made uh, public as of yet. But what we do know is the EU is desperate right now. They are increasingly looking for alternative suppliers for gas and uh, oil, especially because of what's going on in Russia and Ukraine. So because of this desperation, because of this uh, extreme search for alternatives, they are looking increasingly more to markets like Nigeria, Angola, Africa, Africa to fill up these uh, supply shortages. So Russia is also looking at Africa. Yeah. Russia yes. has a um, Russia-Africa summit coming up in, I think, in October. Yeah. So Russia is also looking at Africa. But the EU is desperate, we agree. Yeah. But will they be desperate enough to overlook the issue of insecurity, vandalism of pipeline we're dealing with in yeah. oil. It's not far away from gas, theft, and yeah. all of that. And I mean, up till now, we cannot categorically say this is the amount of crude produced in Nigeria yeah. every day. This is the amount that is being supplied. This is the amount that is yeah. consumed. We can't do that. Yeah. You understand? Yeah. Would they be desperate enough to overlook some of this Factors, factors that are not so you know palatable uh, so uh, to add some context to the eu's current plight uh eu electricity prices right now are at their highest sustained level on record so uh the price of a megawatt hour of uh, electricity in germany to be delivered uh, next year is now like 350 euro per megawatt hour in france it has doubled from the beginning of the year it's not about 360 euro per megawatt hour. So this is directly related to the issue of gas. So the EU uses gas to uh, fuel their, to, uh, to electricity. generate electricity. Yeah. And because gas prices are so high, because Russia has cut off, is, is cutting off uh, gas supplies <laughs> yeah, to off. the EU, that is fueling the increase in energy costs. It is driving up inflation in the EU and it's really putting them in, putting them in a very precarious situation, a situation that they are increasingly desperate to find alternative suppliers to cover up. Yeah, so so with this desperation, they should yeah. be able to overlook yes. <laughs> our misgivings. <laughs> All right. But depot owners are still saying that they can't mm -hmm. handle the 165 Naira. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I know like last week, um, um, I think the NMDPRA, yeah. they were out trying to ensure that filling stations stick to 165. Yeah. How do you see this, this balancing out? I mean, if they're saying... Our operational cost has increased. Diesel is about 850 yeah. naira, and they use diesel for operations. For operations. They use diesel for distribution, yeah. you know. And the, the government is saying you must stick you to must 100, stick. Uh, 165. How do you see it? How do you see it balancing? Uh, That's why yeah. some filling stations are short. Yeah, it's not down. that they don't yeah. have product, but they're just short there. Yeah, shutting down. It is a very very, very dangerous uh, situation, to put it mildly. So, uh, like you said, operating costs are rising, and they just simply cannot... Con so they are currently running at a deficit. They are currently running at a loss because of the high operating costs. So, the oil prices globally are high. This is, of course, in reducing, or rather increasing the value of the products that they have to sell. So, now they are now selling it at sort of a loss. So we saw what happened in regards to uh, transporters. We, we saw that when the transporters came out and said, oh, we cannot keep running at this same price, the government did give them a sort of a subsidy. The government did find something to sort of alleviate their burden. So now what we are seeing is the depot owners are coming out to say the same thing. So, okay, if you have done these, this for the uh, transportation guys, you should be able to do this for us as well. You should be able to alleviate some of our burden. So that is what they are sort of looking for right mm -hmm. now. And the issue with that is that it will need more increases. subsidies. Exactly. exactly. That increases the increases subsidies. subsidies. So it is a very 
it is sort of a cycle. So do you increase the uh, subsidies and put yourself in a very detrimental fiscal situation? Or do you sort of allow the market to run uh, unregulated and see how that pans out? How demand and yeah. supply factors will, yes. you know, try to balance out. But okay, away from oil and gas now, um, pepper, tomatoes, yeah. rice, tatashi, mm -hmm. everything, everything is up. Mm -hmm. Is it because it's planting season? I know that's a factor. That, that is a factor, yes, but then it also goes back to logistics costs and what is driving up logistics costs, the cost of transportation, the cost of fuel. So we are seeing these costs rise and of course uh, it, is affect, it is trickling down into the prices of these commodities. Then it also goes back to the issue of uh, supply disruptions globally. Global supply is having issues, there's shortages across the globe. So yeah, it, it is a very, very big <laughs> factor. It's a mess of different things. You could say it's sort of a perfect storm in regards to everything, you yeah. A perfect storm. Yes. Well, Lange, thank you so much for Definitely, sharing your thoughts yeah. with us. Uh, we'll continue to track these uh, issues. I mean, we live with them every day, <laughs> so we can hardly run away from it. But we do hope uh, that a solution comes up in, in the shortest possible time. Thank you so much thank for you. your time. Yeah. All right, so let's go to the markets now. Certainly not the one for oil and gas or the one for tomatoes. <laughs> let's go to uh, the fixed income and the equities market. Starting with equities market, we see that activities in the domestic equities market resumed the week on a sore note. Investors took profits of Nigeria breweries. Uh, they lost 5%. The all share index settled lower, 0.07%, and the equities cap is at 27 point nine two trillion naira that's what we saw yesterday dates to uh, date return moderated uh, profit to date re return moderated to 21.2 uh, percent the total volume traded increased by over 50 percent to 194.12 million units valued at 2.82 billion naira deals uh, well, it's in the green, but I mean, we've seen greater deals than this. We've had more than 5,000. We saw that Transco was the most traded stock by volume, while MTN was the most traded stock by value at uh, 799.90 million naira. Performance across sectors was mixed. The consumer goods um, lost 0.9%. Oil and gas down 0.4%. Industrial goods 0.12%. Insurance uh, in the green and oil and gas there 0.35%. Market breadth yesterday was negative. 17 tickets lost relative to 16 gainers. Corn oil lost uh, almost 10%. Red streak, same thing. Top the losers list. While Fitzin uh, the top gainers and Learn Africa recorded the most significant gains of the day. Let's move over to the fixed income market now and see how that market was um, picked up a bit, gone back to being quiet, uh, and we see that lending rate has remained at 14%. I think over a week now we've seen that at 14 uh, percent and that's because of absence of significant funding pressure uh, starting with the central bank bills there we saw 107 deals yesterday valued at 27.75 uh, billion naira and uh, August 2022 was one of the favored by investors a lot of activities there in the federal government bonds 25 deals valued at 4.13 billion naira and uh, we see there that February 2028 was the most favored by investors yesterday the rest were two and two that's for the federal government bonds and uh, we're still expecting some activities in this market 38 deals for the treasury bills valued at 12.2 billion naira there you see there the short-term uh, equity or security which uh, matures in november this year had 22 
deals as at yesterday. Well, uh, analysts have said that uh, we're expecting, I mean, an MPC is coming in a couple of weeks, just after next week, in two weeks, MPC is coming. And so we expect that uh, perhaps they will have another movement there. Are there almost there, the securities uh, open market, open market securities there, the two deals yesterday valued at just 500 million naira, just the August 2022 bill uh, that, that was favored yesterday. Going over now to the unlisted market. Let's see how the unlisted market fared yesterday. We had um, market cap yesterday was over a trillion naira. We've had uh, this market stay at a trillion naira for over a week. You know, so we are glad that at least this, there's a bit of movement there. It ended in the positive yesterday, 0.07%. And uh, only three deals took place in that market yesterday, valued at 1.11 million naira. And the value was uh, 548,900 yesterday. All right, we'll take a break now. When we come back from that break, we'll head to London to stay with us. This is Business Morning on Channels Television. Welcome back. You're still watching Business Morning on Channels Television. We'll head to our London studio now where our correspondent Juliana is standing by. Juliana, good morning. Well, former shadow uh, chancellor John McDonnell is calling for strict price controls. We do understand that in the year of the squeeze, we'll have different ideas, but how does he suppose that this could work? Well, that's a, it's a good question, Innie, and I think that's something that uh, the Labour Party will have to try and uh, find out. Uh, but uh, John McDonnell, as you said, was the former uh, shadow chancellor under uh, the former Labour leader, Jeremy Corbyn, a pretty controversial figure, liked and I would say admired by some, but definitely uh, seen as an extremist left winger um, by others. But... <clears throat> We are, as you said, in the year of the squeeze. The cost of living crisis is affecting uh, millions of families up and down uh, the country. Certain measures that have been put in place by uh, the Chancellor, Rishi Shunak, are just not going far enough. And he has decided to write an open letter on behalf of um, uh, these uh, uh, struggling families and is saying that, yes, there needs to be price controls, not just uh, the windfall tax, which we know was a Labour policy that the Conservative government didn't want uh, to put in place, but after intense pressure they did, they want this to go to more companies, so not just a windfall tax on oil giants, but on other companies that appear to be profiteering at a time uh, where inflation is a fresh 40-year high of 9.1%. So in his open letter, he speaks on um, a price cap on uh, rents, a price cap on energy prices, which we know is going to uh, get much higher when Ofgem, the energy regulator, decide to increase uh, that cap in the autumn. He also spoke about basic food stuff, which is really important because we just had a trading update uh, from Sainsbury's, which is one of the biggest uh, uh, food retailers here in the UK. They're showing uh, that their sales are declining, and that's because uh, people are starting uh, to second guess their choices at the supermarkets, going for cheaper items. And some people are not going for any items at all because it is just so expensive to feed your family now. So he's written this um, open letter. Let's see if it's picked up by any of the backbenchers tomorrow during Prime Minister's questions. All right, we'll see to that. And uh, still talking about uh, the cost of living, firms are warning that consumers want more than low prices. What else do consumers want? Yeah, that's, again, that's an, an, another million pound question. Uh, but according to the Institute of Customer Service, they've conducted this survey. They've been conducting this survey ever since the cost of living crisis became a huge issue. They speak to about 100,000 uh, people in the UK and six out of 10 of them say they want more. They want uh, staff uh, to be more, um, I would say, aware of uh, the tight budget constraints that people have now. They don't just want to have cheap products, but they want to have value for money products. Uh, they they are asking uh, firms to do more in the way they're speaking to customers. We know that a lot of people are, are, are being crippled uh, by humongous debt at the moment. Even the FCA, they wrote a letter 
to about 3,000 CEOs in uh, the country, just asking people to please just be mindful uh, when you're chasing people down, knocking on their doors, asking for your money back, that it is a really difficult time. And I think that's what's been doubled down um, in this survey that was conducted by the Institute of Customer Service, just basically saying that people do want value for money, but they also want good customer service. They want people to be a little bit more sympathetic, empathetic, understanding what customers' needs are and therefore giving them more choice um, when it comes uh, to the check. Out. So pretty much what most people in the UK, and I, as you would always say, and across the world in Nigeria in particular want, um, is just more value uh, for their money. So it can stretch much further in really difficult times. Yeah, uh, well, I, I think, Juliana, another way to look at this would be these are tips, you know, to survive the, the, the year of the squeeze, you know. I mean, let's find a way to give ourselves a little bit of buffer in the midst of it all. Yeah. I completely agree with you, Annie. Thank you so much, Julian. I will talk to you again at 1.30. Thank you. All right, uh, let's see if the year of the squeeze is still squeezing that crypto space there with Laddie Williams. Well, yeah, it, it's still uh, squeezed, you know, at this oh, point. Oh, Laddie, I see 19. <laughs> well, yeah, that, I mean, an improvement. I, I, think it, I, I think this calls for an applause. Exactly, because we've not <laughs> seen 19 we've been in a at, while. We've been at four, we've been at 10 for so long. So long, That's so seeing long. 19. Yeah, even though it's still extreme fear. Even though it's still extreme fear, it, but... It's an improvement. It's We're a seeing... subtle extreme fear. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know when we will see greed again. Let's, let's be hopeful. Let's index. keep hope alive. Well, it'll be very interesting to see <laughs> to see that happen. Uh, let's look at the uh, market cap now. We see it's uh, 917. $0.19 billion. It's up 5.83%. We're seeing the market uh, quite green today with a couple of uh, altcoins uh, having double-digit gains. We're seeing Bitcoin there above $20,000. So it's looking good in this market. We're seeing a lot of buying pressure right now. 24-hour volume traded in the total crypto space is up 54.36%. And we see Bitcoin dominance 42.36% uh, this morning. And price of Bitcoin, 20000 $363, up 6.43%. It is get as high as $20,400, but we have that resistance at $20,500. was trading at $19,000. We saw that big spike there, about a 6% move there by Bitcoin. Uh, volume traded $23.83 uh, billion. And we see the king of the altcoins is not left out in this uh, uh, move. We see it's up 10.89% at $1,163. We've seen this $1,000 mark hold well for Ethereum for a few weeks now. Volume traded $14.92 uh, billion. And looking at the top odds, my market cap is all green on that counter. It's quite a, a green Tuesday we're seeing. But uh, fast forward to Thursday, we'll be seeing if this uh, momentum is maintained. Uh, let's bring in Amari Sashay now, uh, eCash uh, creator. Hello, Amari. Hello, Amari. Great to have you. Yeah, so, uh, Amari, there's been conversations about DeFi, you know, decentralized finance for a while now, and we've seen a lot of these platforms spring up, you know, promising uh, decentralized finance, and uh, we've seen Bitcoin dominance actually tending downwards. Some analysts say it's because of these other platforms coming up. That's why we're seeing, you know, Bitcoin dominance go down. How do you see it? Yeah, so you got to keep in mind that in the beginning of crypto, there was only Bitcoin, right? So dominance was 100%. And from there, there is only one direction you can go, right? Uh, unfortunately, it's down. <laughs> um, as more and more platform emerge, then we should expect that dominance to go down. Though um, we need to keep in mind when we go to those other platforms that almost all of them are more risky than Bitcoin, right? Like even though we can expect some of them to perjure over time and take some of that market dominance from Bitcoin. We don't know which one ahead of time, right? So um, Bitcoin remain, you know, like the safest asset in the space. And uh, yeah, that's how it is, right? And right. the safer it is, the lower the return usually. So, you know, that's how it works in any market and, and the crypto market is not an exception. Okay, but do you think we'll see like, uh, DeFi on uh, Bitcoin's network or any of the forks of Bitcoin? Is that possible? Um, on Bitcoin itself, it's very unlikely because the, the 
capabilities in terms of smart contract are quite different. Uh, on some of the fork of Bitcoin, we're going to see that eventually. Um, on, I know that you know it's in the roadmap for eCash, for instance. But it works in... So the way it works is that you create an EVM-based system and then you create a bridge between the EVM and the main chain. You cannot really do that on the main chain in a Bitcoin style system. And uh, the Bitcoin BTC crowd is you know, not very adamant to this kind of construct. So this is unlikely that this is gonna emerge on BTC. Quite interesting. And, and it seems like it's only decentralized you know, platforms that can actually give out like DeFi uh, products at this point. Um, yeah, it's mostly, you know, it's mostly a regulatory reason. If you want to provide this kind of product as a centralized company, you need to be registered in many jurisdictions, comply with a lot of different regulations. And this is a huge barrier to entry, right? And uh, as a result, it's not so easy to launch this kind of service. Obviously, some companies are doing it, but uh, the pace of innovation cannot be as great, right? And uh, what we see in the DeFi space is by going decentralized, many of those requirements uh, don't need to be jumped through, right? Um, the flip side of that, though, is that it's a much more risky market than the traditional one because, you know, less regulation means faster innovation, but greater risk as well. And talking about, you know, regulation, we know we have, you know, a couple of these platforms that are decentralized. They don't have a leader. They don't have a CEO. You know, but most of the projects uh, on, on, on the, in the market, you know, they have CEOs. But let's say 10 years from now, do you see more of uh, decentralized platforms, you know, standing the test of time? Yes, but it's difficult to know which one at this time, right? Some of them, like the one that are actually decentralized, well, they may have a leader, they may have a CEO or whatever right now, but they can persist without it, right? Uh, the one that, you know, pretend to be decentralized, but actually are not, they are not going to survive, um, you know, this kind of event. And it's quite difficult to know which one is which one because you have to dwell deeply into the detail, the technical detail of all the things is constructed. And, you know, most people don't have the skill to do that, but also the people who have the skill to do that usually are too busy to actually be able to do it for all the projects in the space. So, so it's going to be, um, it'll be, it'll be something to, it's going to be difficult to guess which one right now, right? Like exactly. some of them will be, but it's very difficult to know ahead of time, which, because a couple of these uh, coins that were present in 2017, most of them are nowhere to be found, you know, right now, mm -hmm. you know, talking about some of this centralized uh, project. But, you know, it's been a tough uh, first half, you know, for the crypto market and, you know, global equities. You know, what can we expect for XEC, you know, going into the second half of 2022? Um well, what we've seen for XCC specifically is that it's it's been affected by the downturn, but maybe not as much as some other crypto. And one of the reasons is that we didn't have the kind of leverage construct that existed on Ethereum and stuff like that, you know, where people lend money to reinvest, to relend, to reinvest, to relend, right? Which allows great gain, but you know, it cut both way, right? So when it goes down, it goes down really dramatically. Um, so you know. What we do at eCash is focus on the fundamental. And hopefully, you know, this is what can provide long-term value because all those like lending and trading, they create value on the short term, but they don't create like fundamentals. And so as a result, what comes up must go down, right? So uh, with eCash, we really want to focus on the fundamental and, and build value over time. Right, talking about building. Thank you so much, Amar Sache, uh, eCash creator. It was great having you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, now let's uh, head back to the markets. Now we see uh, uh, top also market cap is all green there with uh, BNB there, $234 up 8.65%, XRP 32 cents up 3.94%. And we see it's double digit gains on the top five gainers there with CVX up 23%. And we see Matic there, 54 cents up 16%. And uh, Sandbox and Engine, those uh, play to earn platforms back on the top gainers list up 15 and 13.74%. Uh, and top five losers quite 
quite lean. Uh, we're seeing stable coins there showing that traders are moving away from stable coins into uh, most of this cryptocurrency. So uh, in a, it, it, they, they call it the bear market rallies, but they're quite profitable. Yeah, we see that. But you know, one thing that caught my attention uh, in your conversation with Amari is uh, the threat to the dominance of Bitcoin. Yeah. I wonder how, uh, you know, the new face, if I could put it that way, right. of, of cryptocurrency, if the dominance of Bitcoin reduces, as, because as we, you Because we've noted. seen Bitcoin dominance, you know, go down in the past, but somehow it always, you know, gets back that dominance and you know, we'll get that rally before the altcoins start to follow. So the dominance is there, but it will always be challenged by all yeah. these uh, altcoins yeah, at some point. Yeah, because change is the only constant thing in exactly. life anyway. Exactly. Who knows what's going to happen in the next 10 years in this market? Yeah, I might just, I might just create a coin. That would... Why not? Any <laughs> coin. <laughs> all right, laddie, thank you so much. <laughs> well, that's it on the program today. Thank you so much for being a part of it. We'll do a third day tomorrow. But before then, 1.30, Business Incorporated will be here, and you'll get updates from the world of business. I'm Ini John Mekwa. Enjoy the rest of your day.